Les damos muy especialmente la bienvenida al Malva, a esta sala, para compartir juntos en esta tarde la conferencia de Arjun Apaduray, La democracia fatigada, el giro global a la derecha. En nombre de Fundación Medife, queremos agradecerles a todos ustedes su presencia esta tarde. Agradecemos también muy especialmente a Editorial Siglo XXI y le damos la bienvenida a quienes siguen esta conferencia por nuestro canal de YouTube, Fundación Medife. Al finalizar la exposición, Arjuna Paduray y Alejandro Grimson van a comenzar una conversación en la cual podrán intervenir también ustedes con preguntas por escrito que pueden entregarle a las asistentes en la sala en su momento. Les comentamos que el último libro de Arjuna Paduray, publicado en Argentina por Siglo XXI Editores, Hacer negocios con palabras, está disponible en el foyer. Los invitamos a seguir la conversación participando en las redes sociales con el hashtag Apaduray en BA. Y ahora vamos a invitar a subir al escenario al señor Mario Almirón, gerente de Fundación Medife. Hola. Buenas tardes. Le damos la bienvenida a esta conferencia magistral que se marca dentro de nuestro ciclo Conversaciones, donde junto con especialistas nacionales e internacionales buscamos interpalar eh, el pensamiento contemporáneo. El año pasado en una, inauguramos este ciclo de Conversaciones aquí en el Malva con la presencia de una destacada pedagoga que es Inés Dussel. Hoy celebramos la presencia de Arjun Apaduray, quien con su mirada lúcida y crítica nos ayudará a reflexionar sobre las transformaciones culturales, sociales y económicas de la sociedad contemporánea y los regímenes políticos. El ciclo de conversaciones continúa el martes, 21, el martes 21 en la Casa Nacional del Bicentenario con la presencia de la epistemóloga eh, Vincent Desprez. La última cita del año será el martes 12 de diciembre en el Centro Cultural de la Ciencia, donde escucharemos al sociólogo Richard Sennett. Agradecemos en, pri en primer lugar a Arjuna Paduray por su presencia esta noche, a Alejandro Grimson por acompañarnos moderando la conferencia y a todos ustedes por su presencia. Muchas gracias. La conferencia, como hemos dicho, va a ser moderada por Alejandro Grimson. Eh, él es doctor en Antropología de la Universidad de Brasilia, investigador independiente de CONICET, profesor titular de UNSAM. Como antropólogo social, se ha especializado en migraciones, identidades, nacionalismos y cultura política. Lo invitamos a que suba al escenario y lo recibimos también con un aplauso, Alejandro. Bueno, evidentemente es un gran honor eh, poder presentar a Arjuna Paduray. Agradezco y felicito a la Fundación por este tipo de iniciativas que enriquecen eh, nuestro conocimiento y nuestros debates. Arjuna es uno de los antropólogos más importantes del mundo. ¿Qué es un antropólogo? ¿Qué es un gesto antropológico? ¿Qué es algo que hacen muchos que no son antropólogos. Yo creo que Arjun en su obra nos permite terminar de otra manera un cuento que los antropólogos muchas veces hemos contado. Básicamente en la primera escena está el antropólogo clásico que viaja a pueblos no occidentales para estudiar mundos completamente desconocidos un antropólogo que tenía que familiarizarse con lo exótico. En la segunda escena estaba el antropólogo de las últimas décadas del siglo XX que estudiaba su propia sociedad tratando de producir una distancia, una exotización de lo familiar. Pero yo creo que la obra de Arjun contribuye claramente a introducir una tercera escena, un tercer momento que es fundamental no solo para la antropología, sino que, como toda su obra, 
trasciende las fronteras de la antropología para dialogar con otras disciplinas. ¿Por qué? Porque ya esa frontera entre el mundo exótico y el mundo familiar se vuelve mucho más dudosa, mucho más eh, ambivalente y en ese sentido empezamos a sentir, como alguna vez dijo Edward Said, al mundo entero como un lugar extraño. Y Arjun combina lo familiar y lo extraño de una manera única en su trabajo. Uno de sus libros más conocidos, Modernity at Large, que fue traducido por el gran amigo Hugo Achugar como La modernidad desbordada, lleva un subtítulo que es muy tentador para buscar alguna clasificación de esta mente brillante y prolífica de Apaduray. ¿A dónde colocarlo? El subtítulo de ese libro decía es las dimensiones culturales de la globalización, pero puede llevar a más de uno a una trampa, porque la palabra cultura en la obra de Apaduray no es, por supuesto, que las bellas artes, pero tampoco es una esfera completamente escindida de otras esferas como si fueran la economía, la política, la sociedad, la cultura. En la obra de Apaduray no hay política, no hay economía afuera del lenguaje, afuera del trabajo de la imaginación. No hay economía, no hay política fuera de los panoramas de las ideas, de los panoramas étnicos, de los panoramas de la diversidad, de los panoramas de las tecnologías. Su objeto es la globalización y sigue globalizándose, por decirlo así. Y eso recorre una parte muy importante de su obra, muy vasta. Desde la vida social de las cosas, dislocación y diferencia en la economía cultural global, el futuro como un hecho cultural, hasta su reciente hacer negocios con palabras. Arjun nació en Bombay, trabajó en las más prestigiosas universidades del mundo, actualmente es profesor en New York University, mientras está viviendo en Berlín, mientras también de vez en cuando es profesor en Bombay, en la India, y si alguien quisiera localizarlo en cualquiera de estos lugares, fracasaría porque hoy está acá con nosotros. O sea que Arjun es un pensador de la globalización que él mismo es un capítulo crucial del cosmopolitismo. Por último, quisiera decir que un pensador global crítico como Arjun es alguien comprometido con el pasado, el presente y el futuro de su país y de su planeta. Pensar es actuar, hacer alternativas con palabras que encarnen también otros caminos más justos, más democráticos de pensar y de construir el mundo, mostrando con su obra que eso también es posible. Quiero invitarlos a que compartamos entonces su conferencia. So let me begin uh, with uh, thanks. First of all, to uh, all of you here today, uh, very thrilling for me, and still uh, at my advanced age, somewhat unbelievable <laughs> that uh, a wonderful, uh, diverse uh, group like this should uh, choose not to be in the lovely uh, end of a beautiful day here at Buenos Aires and come into this spectacular auditorium, but still to be enclosed and to listen to somebody saying something is still a, a, a very uh, 
wonderful sensation for me. So I thank you all, but I also want to thank uh, uh, the Fondation Medife, to uh, my colleagues who welcome me, uh, very especially to Daniela Gutierrez, who has uh, been in dialogue with me for, I don't know, quite a while now, a year or more, uh, about this event, maybe close to two now, um, and who has been a marvelous host here, to the CEO who also came today to a very nice lunch event, uh, and to all the other wonderful people in, uh, in uh, the Medife organization who have helped in many ways to make this first day of mine uh, very rich, very fruitful, very full, uh, and very uh, uh, welcoming to me. I also want to thank Malba uh, for making this space and this occasion uh, possible. Uh, and last but not least, uh, to uh, Alejandro Grimson for having been part of an earlier conversation today and for taking on then the uh, responsibility to moderate and introduce me uh, this evening and do so so uh, graciously and so generously. I would be amiss if I did not also add a word of acknowledgement of a very old friend, uh, Elizabeth Helene, who welcomed me here uh, longer ago. I, I somehow thought it was 15 years, but it turns out to be well past 20. Uh, it tells you how things change in the, in the light of uh, time. So this is a return for me, but after a very long time, to uh, Buenos Aires and to its environs. Uh, and it is, uh, of course, clear that many things have changed. But I have to say, as a person who does not come here all the time, I do recognize the city. It is still a kind of Hausmannian paradise on a huge scale that Paris cannot imagine. Uh, very beautiful, very stunning, and of course, coming from Berlin, uh, having sun uninterrupted is a very special thing. Uh, Berlin is a great city, but long and sunny days are not one of its virtues. So uh, for many, many reasons, I'm very glad to be here and have a chance to share ideas with you, uh, uh, a process which began early today and has continued with some interviews and conversations with some wonderful people from the world of journalism. So I turn now to uh, more or less read from my text, which is something that I wrote uh, in my time in Germany. So you will understand that it has a kind of location. It's not a view from nowhere. I was living in Berlin. I was trying to understand Europe. Uh, I was, uh, this was written about three months after the election of Trump, uh, uh, before the election victory of Macron over Le Pen. That was still an open question. Uh, Merkel seemed to be secure, but we now know she's slightly less secure than it appeared, but she's still in charge. So though it was very recently written, it already feels like it was a historical moment where there were things were a certain way, and now already we're moving on. Still, uh, I say this to, to tell you that Europe was my environment when I wrote this for a German publisher, Surkamp, who then... Uh, I've put out uh, a book with many essays. Mine is one of them, and I'm going to give a kind of version of it today. But that book is uh, available, and it's called, uh, I promote it because it has many other fine people in it. Uh, it's called The Great Regression, Die Grosse Regression, and it's available in many languages, I believe Spanish as well, uh, if not very soon. Um, edited by a, a, a German colleague who actually works at Zorkamp called Heinrich Geiselberger. So it's not an easy name, but the book is The Great Regression, Heinrich Geiselberger. It's available in English through Polity, many other languages. And it has some very interesting uh, group of uh, mostly European intellectuals in it. And I was honored to be asked to write an essay, and so I had to think. And the theme was, why are we going backwards in many parts of the world? Hence the great regression. Uh, and by that, the signal was to think about something like the global swing to the right. So I had to think about this uh, sort of for the first time in a very fast changing uh, world, both in Europe and in the United States and in India. So these were the main places in my mind, but I tried to look a little bit beyond. So I now will do some reading and I'll occasionally depart 
from uh, my text. The central question of our times is whether we are witnessing the worldwide rejection of liberal democracy and its replacement by some sort of populist authoritarianism. Strong signs of this trend are to be found in Trump's America, Putin's Russia, Modi's India, and Erdogan's Turkey. In addition, we have numerous European examples of already existing authoritarian governments, Orban in Hungary, Duda in Poland, and major aspirants to authoritarian right-wing rule in France, Austria, and other European Union countries. The total population of these countries is about, is almost a third of the total population of the world, and I've not included China for some special reasons. If so, the number would be even higher. So this is a very significant part of the world's population, nor have I included quasi-authoritarian regimes such as uh, some of the regimes in Latin America, many, many regimes in Africa, uh, Duterte in the Philippines. So the comparative question is open. I don't mean to close it and say these are the five bad people. Uh, their cousins and friends and relatives are to be found everywhere, uh, but I'm focusing on a few. So been, there's been growing alarm about this global shift to the right, but we have relatively few good explanations of it. And in this argument, in this lecture, I want to offer one example, uh, one explanation, and one example of a way to build an alternative. So I want to begin by a reflection on leaders and followers. I believe we need to rethink the relationship between leaders and followers in the new populisms that surround us. I want to say I'm going to end with a reflection on the word populism because from the beginning of the day today when I was talking to Daniela, I realized the, this word not only has debates about it in the US and Europe, but maybe have very different meanings here in Argentina and maybe in Latin America. So I want to flag it and say I'm not imposing a single definition. I have a certain sense of the word, but I'm very open to debating how far the word reaches and what it means in different places. So on leaders and followers. Whatever populism is, it involves leaders and followers, that's for sure. Our traditional habits of analysis lead us to imagine that major social trends in the political sphere have to do with such things as charisma, propaganda, ideology, and other factors, all of which presume a large connection between leaders and followers. Today, leaders and followers do, of course, connect. But this connection is based, in my view, on an accidental and partial overlap between the ambitions, visions, and strategies of leaders and the fears, wounds, and angers of their followers. The leaders who have risen in the new populist movements are typically xenophobic, <coughs> patriarchal, and authoritarian in their styles. I was jokingly saying to one of the people who interviewed me today, this is a very big potential export for Latin America, a kind of macho male form of leadership is now really a worldwide uh, uh, model, maybe Latin America less. Uh, this is like Buddhism, which is a great export success from India, but failed in India. So I hope that maybe this is failing in Latin America, but unfortunately succeeding in the rest of the world. Their followers may share some of these tendencies, but they are also fearful, angry, and resentful of what their societies have done for them. These profiles do, of course, meet, especially in elections however rigged or managed they may be. But this meeting place is not easy to understand. Why do some Muslims in India and the United States vote for Modi and Trump? Why do some women in the United States adore Trump? Why do groups from the former GDR, now German Democratic Republic, East Germany, now vote for right-wing politicians? Why do groups from the, uh, to address these puzzles requires us to think about leaders and followers in the new populisms somewhat independently of one another. So that's my first suggestion. We don't immediately assume deep overlap between leaders and followers and see them somewhat separately. So let me talk about the leaders, the message from above. The new populist leaders recognize that they aspire to national leadership in an era in which national sovereignty is in crisis. The biggest symptoms of this crisis of sovereignty is that no modern state, no modern state controls what could be called its national economy. 
This is equally a problem for the richest and poorest of nations. The United States economy is substantially in Chinese hands. The Chinese depend crucially on raw materials from Africa and Latin America, as well as other parts of Asia. Everyone depends to some extent on Middle Eastern oil, and virtually all modern nation states depend on sophisticated armaments from a small number of wealthy countries, actually in Europe and the US. Economic sovereignty as a basis for national sovereignty was always a dubious principle. Today, it is increasingly irrelevant. In the absence of any national economy which modern states can claim to protect and develop, it is no surprise that been, there's been a worldwide tendency in effective states and in many aspiring populist movements to perform national sovereignty by turning towards cultural majoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, and the stifling of internal intellectual and cultural dissent. In other words, the loss of economic sovereignty everywhere produces a shift towards emphasizing cultural sovereignty. This turn towards culture as the site of national sovereignty appears in many forms. And I give rapidly some examples from the ones I've already mentioned. Take Russia in the hands of Vladimir Putin. In December 2014, not so long ago, Putin signed a decree setting up a state cultural policy for Russia centered on the maxim, Russia is not Europe, in quotes, reflecting an explicit hostility to the cultural West and to European multiculturalism characterizing it as neutered and barren, both loaded sexual expressions, enlists Russian masculinity as a political force. This document is an explicit call to return to traditional Russian values and is anchored in a deep history of Slavophile sentiment and Russophile cultural politics. In this case, the context for the, uh, for, the, for the document was the battle over the future of Ukraine and underlie the cancellation of musical concerts by anti-Kremlin rock musician Andrei Makarevich in, Ukraine, in the Ukraine, while reflecting the long -term, longer term harassment of the musical group Pussy Riot, among others. This policy, 2014, Putin, calls for a unified cultural space throughout Russia and makes it clear that Russian cultural uniqueness and uniformity are crucial tools against cultural minorities at home and political enemies abroad. Turkey under Recep Erdogan has also turned culture into a theater of sovereignty. The main vehicle of his strategy is to advocate a return to Ottoman traditions, language forms, and imperial grandeur, an ideology that his, critiques, his critics have dubbed neo-Ottomanism. This vision of Turkey also encodes its global ambitions, its resistance to Russian ambitions in the Middle East, and its hopes as a counterweight, and, 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 and be, uh, presents Turkey as a counterweight to uh, the uh, resistance to Turkey in the European Union. This new Ottoman posture is also a key part of Erdogan's ambition to marginalize and replace the secular nationalism of Kemal Ataturk, the icon of modern Turkey, with a more religious and imperial style of rule. Turkey has also witnessed considerable censorship of art and cultural institutions, and recently massive jailing and harassment of academics on a, on a kind of the highest scale uh, that I can see in relation to population size in the world. Alongside direct repression of popular political dissent, as in Geza Park in 2013. In many ways, the best example of the new authoritarian leaders, uh, uh, of how the new authoritarian leaders produce and maintain a popular strategy is to be found in Narendra Modi, the right-wing ideologue who now enjoys the prime ministership of India. Modi has a long-term career as a party worker and activist on the Hindu right in India. He served as chief minister of Gujarat from 2001 to 2014 and was implicated in the statewide genocide of Muslims in Gujarat in 2003 after some Muslims attacked a train carrying Hindu pilgrims through Gujarat. Many progressive Indians still believe that Modi actively orchestrated this genocide, but he has managed to overcome many judicial and civil condemnations and win the campaign and won the campaign to become prime minister of India in 2014. He's an open advocate of Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, 
as the governing ideology of India, and like many of the current crop of authoritarian populists across the world, he combines extreme cultural nationalism with markedly neoliberal policies and projects. Under his two year, uh, two, uh, now three year, four year leadership in India, there have been uh, three years, three plus. There have been an unprecedented number of assaults on sexual, religious, cultural, and artistic freedoms in India, anchored in a systematic dismantling of the secular and socialist heritage of Jawaharlal Nehru and the nonviolent vision of Mahatma Gandhi. Under Modi, war with Pakistan is always a heartbeat away. India's Muslims are living in growing fear, and India's Dalits, so-called untouchable, lowest caste, are brazenly attacked and humiliated every day. Modi has brought together the lexicon of ethnic purity with the discourse of cleanliness and sanitation, that is, ethnic cleansing meets sanitary cleansing. Indian cultural images abroad and Hindu domination at home are the cornerstones of Indian sovereignty in the Modi worldview. And so it is with our latest nightmare, the victory of Donald Trump in the US elections of November 9, 2016, now almost uh, well, just over a year. This event was barely two weeks old when I wrote these words. So even hindsight at that time was in poor supply. It's not in much better, better supply now. But Trump has already, had already begun to act on his election plans with his cabinet appointments and policy utterances since his election. And uh, I believe we cannot expect the fact that he has been president for a year to moderate his style. Trump's message, which combines misogyny, racism, xenophobia and megalomania on an unprecedented scale in recent history is, uh, 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 is centered on two extreme messages, two extreme messages, one implicit and one explicit. And I believe we are still hearing them one year after his victory. The explicit message is his aim to make America great again by beefing up foreign military options for the US, renegotiating various trade deals that he believes have diminished American wealth and prestige, unshackling American businesses from various tax and environmental constraints, and above all in his promise to register all Muslims in the USA, deport all illegals, beef up American borders, and massively increase immigration controls. All of these, he's being resisted, thank God. But he's not given up on any of these things. There's, of course, the wall uh, with Mexico the biggest kind of Borgesian fantasy that he had, which he's withdrawn from. But the general idea has not changed. The implicit message is racist and racial and speaks to those white Americans who feel they have lost their imagined dominance in American politics and economy to blacks, Latinos, and migrants of every type. Trump's biggest rhetorical success is to put the Trojans of whiteness into the horse of every one of his messages about American greatness. So that making America great again is the public way to promise that whites in America will be great again. This is the first time that a message about America's power in the world has become a dog whistle for making whites the ruling class of and in America again. The message about the salvation of the American economy has been transformed into a message about saving the white race. So this is what the leaders, I said I'll talk about the leaders. So this is about the leaders. This is what the leaders of the new authoritarian populisms have in common. A recognition that none of them truly can control their national economies, which are hostages to foreign investors, global agreements, transnational finance, and mobile labor and capital in general. All of them promise national cultural purification as a route to global political power. All of them are friendly to neoliberal capitalism with their own versions of how to make it work for India, Turkey, the United States, or Russia. All of them seek to translate soft power into hard power. All of them have no hesitation about repressing minorities and dissidents, stifling free speech, or using the law to throttle their opponents. This worldwide package is also visible in Europe, in Theresa May's England, in the efforts, fortunately at the moment, uh, put uh, at, uh, at bay of Marianne, Marion Le Pen's France, Viktor Orban's Hungary, Andrzej Duda's Poland, and in, in now more recently, even since I wrote all this, in Austria and many other places. 
in Europe. So in Europe, the flashpoints for this trend are the fear of the latest wave of migrants, 2015, the summer, the anger and shock about various terrorist attacks in major European cities over the last five to eight years, and of course, the shock of the Brexit vote. Thus, populist authoritarian leaders and demagogues are to be found everywhere in Europe, and they too operate with the same mix of neoliberalism, cultural chauvinism, anti-immigrant anger, and majoritarian rage uh, as the major models that I've discussed already, Putin, Trump, etc. So this is one way to look at the leaders of the new authoritarian populisms and their appeals. Now, what about the followers? So this section is called Vox Populi. Since I've said leaders and followers are not to be understood exactly the same way, now the followers. So I've already suggested that we should not, in these movements worldwide, assume that followers simply endorse or replicate the beliefs of the leaders they seem to adore. There is, of course, a certain overlap or compatibility between what these leaders decry, condemn, or promise, and what their followers believe or fear. But as I have said, the overlap is partial, and the popular followings that, allowed, that have allowed Modi, Putin, Erdogan, and Trump, as well as Le Pen, May, Orban, Duda, and Europe to achieve and retain power, have their own worlds of belief, affect, and motivation. And to understand what these worlds are like, I return to the famous ideas of the political economist and philosopher Albert Hirschman in his brilliant book, Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. Quite an old book. Hirschman in this book provides a powerful understanding of how human beings respond to decline in products, organizations, and states by remaining loyal to them, which is loyalty, leaving them, which is exit, or staying with them to protest the decline by voice, voicing opposition, that is complaining. The great originality of Hirschman's analysis was its link of consumer behavior to organizational and political behavior. And his approach was a vital move in understanding how long and in what circumstances ordinary people could tolerate disappointment with products, organization, and states, organizations and states before they switched brands, countries, or membership organizations. Published in 1970, Hirschman's book was a deep insight into modern capitalist democracies before globalization began to undo the logic of national economies, local communities, and place-based identities. It was also written before the rise of the internet and social media, and thus could not have anticipated the nature of disappointment and protest in the world of the 21st century. Still, Hirschman's ideas remind us that Brexit is above all about exit. And that exit is always in some relationship to loyalty and to voice. So how can Hirschman's use of these terms help us today? I suggest that from the point of view of those mass followings that support Trump, Modi, Erdogan, and other established or rising figures of authoritarian populism, the exit that far too many people are today supporting is a form of voice and not an alternative to it. More concretely, Hirschman was right that elections were the major way in which citizens, citizens enacted voice, citizens in democracies enacted voice and showed how disappointed or happy they were with their leaders. But elections today and the recent American elections are an excellent, excellent example have become a way to exit from democracy itself rather than a means to repair and debate politics, which is what elections are supposed to be in democratic theory. The approximately 55 million voters who voted for Trump voted for him and, in my view, against democracy. In this sense, their vote was a vote for exit. And so it was with the elections, uh, election of Modi, the election of Erdogan, and the pseudo elections in favor of Putin, because all these people have some kind of electoral theater that they stage, more or less legitimate. Even the case of the People's Republic of China, which I'm staying away from for this lecture, there is a kind of representational structure that goes from the local party structure up through the region to the high command. It's not simply five people at the top. There is some drama of participation, even in the context of the 
uh, People's Republic of China and, and uh, the Communist Party of China. In each of these cases, and in many of the populist pockets of Europe, there is, here's my title, a fatigue with democracy itself. And this fatigue is the basis of electoral successes, of leaders who promise to abrogate all the liberal, deliberative, and inclusive components of their national versions of democracy. So notice I say a fatigue with democracy. It's not that democracy is fatigued, it is that people are fatigued or fed up with democracy. It might be objected that all populist leaders thrive on this sort of frustration with democracy and have built their careers on it, going back in a very uh, troubling way to Hitler, in Argentina with Perón, with Stalin, with many other leaders from the first half of the 20th century who exploited the failures of the democracies of their times and places. So what is new about today's democracy fatigue? There are three ways in which today's large-scale feeling of being fed up with democracy itself has a distinct logic and context. The first is that the spread of the internet and the social media to growing sectors of the population and the availability of web-based mobilization, propaganda, identity building, and peer seeking has created the dangerous illusion that we can all find peers, allies, friends, collaborators, converts, and colleagues, whoever we are and whatever we want. The second is the fact that every single nation state, as I've said already, has lost ground in its efforts to maintain any semblance of economic sovereignty. This is new. The third factor, also new, is that the worldwide spread of the ideology of human rights, this is very important and a complex subject in its own right, but let me just state it here. The spread of the uh, ideology of human rights has given some minimal purchase to strangers, foreigners, and migrants in virtually every country in the world, even if they face harsh welcomes and severe conditions wherever they move. So it's no longer possible to say you are nobody and nothing. Every migrant has some claim, and it comes from 1948 and the history before that. That is the charter of human rights. Together, these three factors have deepened the global intolerance, the global intolerance for due process, deliberative rationality, and political patience that democratic systems always require. When we add to these three factors the worldwide deepening of economic inequality, the global erosion of social welfare, and the planetary penetration of those financial industries that thrive on multiplying the idea that we are all at risk of financial disaster, this impatience with the low, slow temporalities of democracy is compounded by a constant climate of economic panic. So you're always at panic, everything is going to go, at the same time, we don't have patience for slow deliberation. The same populist leaders who promise prosperity for all often deliberately produce this sort of panic. So Narendra Modi in India, his recent decision to root out black money, that is money that is collected without paying tax, black money, from the Indian economy by demonetizing 500 and 100 rupee currency notes overnight is an excellent case of induced economic distress and financial panic. There was no reason to do this. It's also not worked. It made people miserable. Ordinary people, small vendors, shopkeepers, clerks, people taking public transport, these are modest notes. And they were taken out of circulation overnight. And no one can understand why the man want to do this. What is the big deal here? It's a growing economy and so on and so forth. Well, you have to keep up the sense, one, of induced financial panic, and second, we were talking about this earlier, Daniela, of uh, sacrifice. You must suffer. You must suffer for the nation. Yeah, demonetizing is making you suffer. That's it. That's good. And I gather there are some echoes here now of uh, suffer for the nation because of this and that, and that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with the policy. Uh, so. There is a new chapter being written in the worldwide story of authoritarian populisms, and I believe it is founded on a partial overlap between the ambitions and promises of its leaders and the mentality of its followers. These leaders hate democracy because it is an obstacle to their monomaniacal pursuit of power. I think it's simple. We don't have to do much analysis of these gentlemen. The followers are victims of democracy fatigue who see electoral politics as the best way to exit democracy itself. This hatred and this exhaustion find their natural common ground in the space of cultural sovereignty, 
enacted in scripts of racial victory for resentful majorities, national ethnic purity, and global resurgence through the promises of soft power. India will be the biggest, Turkey will be the biggest. How many biggest can you have? Everybody wants to be on the top in the Olympics. This common cultural ground inevitably hides the deep contradictions between the neoliberal economic policies of most of these authoritarian leaders and their well-documented crony capitalism, which all of them have, and the genuine economic suffering and anxiety of the bulk of their mass followings. This common ground is also the terrain of a new politics of exclusion whose targets are either migrants or internal ethnic minorities or both. Here, Europe is in the uh, on the cutting edge. So I want to close now with a few brief comments on Europe. I don't want to go into great detail. And then a few even less informed comments uh, about what I sense about the situation in Argentina and maybe in other parts of Latin America. The case of Europe, I have some confidence that my general analysis is right. And there is a, 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 a kind of fed upness that you can even see in Germany. And my own view of Germany is not something I had predicted when uh, 20 years ago that I would be saying this about Germany and about Europe, which is that I do see Germany as a, a very important progressive force. For all the criticism that we can make about uh, Merkel and her party and her policies regarding the euro and Greek debt, all true. But there is no question that this is a society that's still uh, massively anchored and very stably in all sorts of liberal institutions. And the reason for that in Europe, I think, is twofold. One, they're a wealthy country. It takes wealth uh, in some ways to be tolerant. The second is they are deeply conscious of, of the Nazi heritage in their country. They do not want to go there again. Nevertheless, uh, the AFD has made progress. They have some 8%. They have seats. They are now a kind of legitimate player in German politics, which is extremely disturbing to most Germans. But it's there. So even Germany is not exempt from the things that I'm talking about, but it has the most strength arrayed against that. Austria has already tipped over in that direction. Uh, Macron narrowly managed to beat Le Pen. Uh, but everywhere, the stakes in Europe are high. And my view, uh, I won't say more about the European situation now, except to say that two things. One, I think, is that the issue of migrants and the so-called migrant crisis since 2015 is a thing which actually reveals structural contradictions in Europe about inequality, about law, about citizenship, about religion. All of these are European issues. They're not something that migrants brought, but the migrants bring them to the surface. They awaken them. That is why there is real anxiety about migrants, though the numbers uh, are only between 4 and 8%, depending on how whether you count non-EU or all uh, migrants to EU countries. It's not a huge number. But the issue is described as if Europe is being swamped. And that is because structural issues are being exposed by the question uh, of migrants. The other thing is I think Europeans are beginning to recognize, certainly in Germany, but to some extent in other places too, especially Europeans I regard as being liberal progressive. Not Europeans from the right who are closing down, who are moving deeper into fortress Europe at the country level or even at sometimes at the city level. But people on the progressive side in Europe, I think, recognize that the solution to global problems, climate, migration, uh, economic wealth, finance, regulation, and the solution to Europe's problems go together. And it's not that you have European solutions and you export them somewhere. It's that you cannot do one without the other. This is, to me, a very hopeful uh, indication. And it's very, very far from the climate in uh, the US. And I'm not sure how it fits with the understanding of things in the larger countries in Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, uh, some of the Andean countries. I'm not sure whether they see that their issues, environment exploitation, democracy, populism, are tied to these global tectonics. And they cannot be radically uh, separate, but when I come to Latin America, uh, about which I have to again repeat that my knowledge is, uh, is, is, is definitely not that of an expert, uh, but I'm also aware uh, that there are some real challenges when you uh, are trained, as I am in India or South Asia, when you're trained uh, in the context of the decolonizing movements of the 1950s, 
Uh, the Latin American trajectory is very different because it's a longer story of colonialism, 500 years, and it's a longer story of national independence, 150 years and more. Uh, and the uh, original colonial rulers were pre-industrial, Spain, Portugal, and so on. So I have, with friends of mine who work on Latin America and who, know, who are experts on it, often try to struggle with these issues. How do we compare them? Because the end of the story, we were talking about this today with some colleagues from Flasco and so on. At the end, everybody looks like they're in a post-colonial situation, but the roads are very different. And my view is that the road must make a difference to the present. And I'm pretty convinced that is true in uh, Latin America, that the nature of the relationship between democratic institutions, uh, elections, populism, uh, questions of economic national sovereignty as came up with the Kirshners who wanted to create a kind of regional sovereignty or national sovereignty uh, in economic terms and get away from the world of IMF and the US and the international banks. Uh, all these things to me are combined in a way that is not uh, easily legible in terms of the other patterns that I see uh, in the US, in Europe, and in in uh, other parts of the decolonizing world. And it's not because of some simple cultural difference. It's really because there's a complex historical trajectory here in which there's one other thing which I should, of course, mention, apart from the long story of colonialism uh, in Latin America, which is very distinctive, is the looming presence of the United States, which over the last 100 years. So there's a leap, as it were, from the first big historical state, which is Spain and Portugal, very small countries, but which managed to play a very big role in this huge continent. And then through, after the kind of national process, the emergence of nations, you have the US arriving, at least 1898, if not earlier. And then nothing can happen here without the US being in the story. This is not exactly true in, in other parts of the world, where the US comes in, in and out. France is very important in many parts of Africa. Britain is still playing huge roles here and there. But in this hemisphere, it's very clear who the dangerous hegemon uh, is. So all of these things contribute to uh, a, a very uh, a different set of formations here. And the only substantive comment uh, I will make concerns the subject of finance, which also came up in our earlier discussion today. And that is that whatever the similarities may be between Latin America and the rest of the, let's call it, third world, in terms of inequality, in terms of violence, in terms of urbanization, uh, and even other things, there is one uh, very striking thing, which is that in the financial sector, at least, I don't mean only the financial sector, but in the financial sector for sure, uh, the major Latin American countries are deeply implicated in the global financial business. So whether it's in Buenos Aires, or in Sao Paulo, or in Rio, or uh, on, the, on the Andean side, the global financial markets uh, find very sophisticated uh, presence in Latin America. And that is certainly not the case in Africa and the Middle East, uh, and not yet the case even in a place like India, which has that technology, which has uh, lots of educated people, tons of wealth looking to play around. But you can't say that the hedge fund world, for example, or the world of bond trading is that developed. Something to do with central banks, and this is where my own expertise, disciplinary expertise is limited. There is some, some factor that slows down high risk financial activity. My sense is that in the major Latin American countries, those markets are pretty uh, much like North American ones. They go as far as they can, deep into uh, our worlds, and this is the subject of uh, the book that Alejandro graciously mentioned on finance or derivatives that I wrote, uh, the main thing I learned from that is the whole financial market world, the world of derivatives, it comes, is based on our capacity, you and me, to produce debt. Housing debt, student debt, uh, insurance debt, consumer debt, plastic, shopping. Every time we produce a dollar of debt, we are feeding straight into the derivatives game. Because that money is not monopoly money. It's money from us. And then it's multiplied. The only trouble is the results of that multiplication, when the one loaf becomes 10 loaves, don't come back down. They stay somewhere in the stratosphere. But the money base is us. So I, I, I will end simply with the question whether in Latin America 
among the many other complexities of nation, region, variations, which I know are huge in this continent, one of the issues is that there is a uh, very complicated relationship to the financial sector. And I've been talking recently, I've had the privilege of meeting a, a wonderful uh, senior economist, a radical economist in Brazil, whom some of you may know or know of, called Lina Lavinas, who writes brilliantly on the current global financial economy, its relationship to pensions and to politics in Brazil. And we've had some wonderful conversations about the way in which uh, Brazil currently is having a massive struggle, which he fears progressive forces are losing, in order to prevent the assets from the social sector from being sucked straight up into the financial sector. And that the politics for her turns on whether Brazil can produce mechanisms to still keep that wall a little strong. But these things I see in Latin America, but I don't know what bigger story they fit into. And I'm sure your questions and comments will help me better understand how to think about this country, but also this, this region. So thank you very, very much for your patience. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Arjun. Ahora, supuestamente van a empezar a llegar papelitos con preguntas y mi trabajo será ordenarlos, pero mientras tanto voy a aprovechar para hacerte alguna pregunta sobre lo que acabas de decir. Quizás dos cosas. La primera es que la sensación que tengo yo es que en Estados Unidos y en Europa principalmente, a partir de la caída del muro de Berlín y hasta estos acontecimientos que vos estuviste relatando, hubo un cierto consenso político neoliberal, en el sentido de que no había una discusión ideológica, como hubo en los años 60 o 50 o en otras épocas del siglo XX, no había una discusión sobre política económica fuertemente, el Partido Demócrata, Republicano, los partidos de derecha o la socialdemocracia tendían a acordar y las discusiones políticas eran más de orden moral, hacemos matrimonio igualitario o no, hacemos este, diversidad de respeto a las minorías y al multiculturalismo. Nancy Fraser llamó a eso el, el, el neoliberalismo progresista. O sea, decía que lo que había era un neoliberalismo progresista, porque bueno, era neoliberal, pero con matrimonio igualitario, con respeto a las minorías, etc. Y ella habla del fin del neoliberalismo progresista, que me parece un punto interesante, porque si había un consenso en muchos de estos países y la crisis del 2008 que vos trabajás, y sus repercusiones fueron erosionando, fueron destruyendo ese consenso desde el punto de vista de los seguidores políticos, de las bases sociales de ese consenso, hay algo que se rompió. Y la duda desde aquí es si esa ruptura, que en América Latina en cierto sentido fue muy distinta, porque fue antes con el neoliberalismo y llevó en otras direcciones, que sería otro tema, pero en el caso de Europa y de Estados Unidos la sensación es que hubo un giro a la derecha y al mismo tiempo algún nivel de polarización, en el sentido de que además de Hillary apareció Sanders como un discurso más de izquierda de los que venía teniendo el Partido Demócrata, en Inglaterra crece todavía hasta hoy la figura de Corbyn liderando el Partido Laborista, que es una posición más a la izquierda de lo que venía estando el Partido Laborista. En España surge Podemos. ¿no? El gobierno de Portugal, que es un gobierno interesante hoy, no es cierto, un país chico, pero el caso de Grecia, que lo conocemos con el caso de Siriza, incluso en Francia, sin tener protagonismo en la segunda vuelta, pero aparece otro fenómeno más de izquierda. O sea, como hay como una sensación por las informaciones que tenemos acá de que esa, ese consenso neoliberal se rompe 
y hay una polarización donde la derecha se impone, porque se impone en el Brexit, se impone en, en Estados Unidos, y eso ya define todo el mapa, y si a eso le agregamos todo lo que vos nos contaste recién, evidentemente es un triunfo muy grande de la derecha. Sin embargo, pareciera que de, de maneras muy distintas, porque Sanders y Podemos son fenómenos muy diferentes realmente, pero son como reac, parecieran ser reacciones que tratan de buscar otras alternativas que nos pueden gustar más o menos a cada uno de nosotros, seguro que en esta sala cada uno piensa muy distinto. Quiero decir, hoy López Obrador, que es un, eh, digamos, eh, una opción hacia la izquierda del escenario político en México, va primero en las encuestas en México, lo cual es como un fenómeno, bueno, ya estuvo, nadie sabe si hubo fraude, no hubo fraude, etcétera, no famosa cuestión con López Obrador, pero quiero decir, pareciera haber otros países donde surgen también otras reacciones. Entonces quería preguntarte que, si te parece que es así, si te parece que es demasiado optimista mirarlo de esa manera, en fin. I think this, is this working? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so thank you, Alejandro. That's a very helpful framing, especially for the challenge we all face, that you know we are somewhat consumed or dominated and even defined by where we happen to be, even if we are moving around. You know, where we are really frames a lot of things. And that is one of the things that is great for me whenever I move further, whether to here or say to South Africa, or, and I don't do it as often as I once did. Uh, but whenever I do, the most salutary thing is that it does a kind of defamiliarizing, uh, what you were referring to before. It changes the angle, you know, somewhat. And your comment has just done that. So yes. Uh, First, I do think there was a consensus, which was not much question, and I always commented uh, when Hillary was uh, running against Trump or even running for the Democratic nominee position, that the whole uh, spectrum had shifted to the right. So somebody who would have been uh, on the left was now in the center, somebody in the center had gone a little bit to the right, somebody on the right had gone to the far right. The whole game had moved. The goalposts had just moved like this. So Hillary, And Bill, it is true, were notoriously friendly to Wall Street, to this one, to that one. Uh, so, and yeah, I think there's something to uh, uh, Nancy Fraser's analysis that, uh, that the, the things had shifted to the cultural domain uh, out of this Uh, political space, though that now has changed. So I think there's something to that. I do think that consensus has broken. I, I should say also that I am very interested in Sanders or in Obrador or in Corbyn or in Podemos because I am still an uh, optimist of the will. That is, I still think that there's a politics of hope, there's a politics of mobilization, and even with finance, that we can make it somehow a more uh, democratic business, that there's nothing inherently anti-democratic about producing, uh, making present potential future wealth, which is what derivatives do. That is not you know, itself a toxic idea. The, the question is how, who does it and who gets the benefits. So I am, in the end, quite hopeful. But on the question of what these indicators are, I agree with you this significant polarization, but in Europe you have some very interesting things which I don't understand. Say in Germany, a very distinguished sociologist like Wolfgang Streich from the left has now become publicly taking the position that Germany should distance itself from globalization. They should take care of the nation. They should deal with uh, German citizens. This is a left argument. And to me, puzzling because it doesn't fit my model. So I'm wondering whether we have polarization, uh, whether that kind of uh, discussion about neoliberalism, uh, which 
for a while did not happen in, um, in the US and in Europe, but did happen here, opens our, uh, should open our attention to some other signs of, let's just say, serious alternatives, which are not radically refusal, no banks, no debt, no this, no IMF, uh, which to me is like saying no industrial revolution, good idea, you know, but not a bit late for that. So we have to have some more creative thinking. So I'm with you on almost everything uh, you say, but I guess I'm wondering where, uh, I mean, a little bit we talked about this earlier today. Why is it that the left, with some exceptions, uh, and you've named several of them, on the whole globally, seems to not be able to get traction with its message, which should be a very appealing message for people whose jobs are disappearing, for people whose wages are going down, for people whose pensions are vanishing. They should be jumping to some version of a left position. But they seem to be willing to do anything to stay away from that, to go this way, to go that way, to go underneath, to go above. Is the problem something structural? Is the problem how we are, say, on the left, sending our message? So this is still to be one of the big questions. But I really appreciate your uh, framing, and I will continue to think about it. Gracias. Eh, bueno, ahora me toca un trabajo muy desagradable porque acá llegaron muchísimas preguntas, muchas fabulosas, pero va a ser imposible, creo que pueda responder todas. Hay, hay eh, gente presente que pregunta cuál es tu visión sobre Venezuela, cuál es tu posición sobre lo que está pasando en Barcelona, sobre distintos lugares. Yo lo, lo menciono de esta manera como para dejarlo picando, quizás Arjun quiere recuperarlo o no, porque obviamente eso... Pero bueno, sí me gustaría, eh, voy a mencionar tres cosas, porque hay una que tiene, como te, ya te había adelantado Daniel, la cuestión uh, de, de... May I make a small suggestion, sorry to interrupt. If you give me a few that sort of have something to do with each other, then I can deal with a cluster, perhaps, so that I don't take too much time with one question and how yeah. many I left. Just three. Group, three. Three is good. Three, three is good. Okay, okay. <laughs> It's okay. Eh, sí, en ese sentido, iba a ser justo eso, ¿qué es? Por un lado aparece una pregunta sobre la definición de populismo, que me parece que tiene que ver con la conversación que vos mencionaste con Daniela, porque, eh, digamos, está claro que en general cuando se habla de populismo en el norte del mundo se identifica que es un populismo de derecha, y, y acá, digamos, en el sur, populismo en, para muchos autores y para mucha gente, hay populismos de derecha y populismos de izquierda. Eh, depende de los momentos. Digo, no, no estoy tomando una posición, pero quiero decir que hay populismos más cercanos al, a los laborismos y hay populismos más... Eh, y que a veces tienen rasgos autoritarios al mismo tiempo, con lo cual son una gran complejidad. Eh, o más cercanos al nacionalismo de mitad del siglo, pero es el nacionalismo de todo el tercer mundo, digamos, en sus distintas variantes, mil variantes, ¿no? Nasser, eh, Perón, Vargas, etcétera, o Cárdenas, etcétera. O sea que son mil variantes distintas de nacionalismo. Entonces, eh, me parece que hay alguien que se enojó porque, con razón, eh, porque, pero, pero no, no, en parte no, porque vos mencionaste grandes líderes de mitad del siglo y dijiste Hitler, Stalin, Perón, y, a, y entonces ahí interpretaron que vos dijiste algo que se dijo mucho en el 45, los antiperonistas en 1945 decían que Perón era nazi. Entonces, bueno, eso es, es muy fuerte. Vos no dijiste eso, pero eso suena o puede sonar fuerte. Como siempre te gusta, siempre decís, me encanta aprender cosas nuevas, bueno, ahí ya te tiro uno. Ahora, las otras dos son mucho más complicadas igual. No. Hay una que es bien complicada y que la desarrollaste mucho en tu conferencia. Son dos preguntas que la sintetizo en una, que es por qué los seguidores apoyan a estos líderes 
porque digamos, lo que dicen las dos preguntas es básicamente lo mismo, va en contra de sus intereses en muchos casos, va en contra de los intereses obreros, esta, estos populismos de derecha generan esclavitud, o generan ajuste, o generan eh, destrucción de beneficios, y et, etc. Entonces, ¿por qué? Ahí apareció el tema del miedo, del odio, de la... aparecieron muchas cosas en tu conferencia que me parece... Y otra pregunta que tiene que ver con otras partes de tu trabajo que no estuvieron hoy presentes, pero que tienen que ver con tu trabajo, que es ¿cuál te parece a vos que es el papel de las nuevas tecnologías y de la comunicación en estos paisajes y en su posibilidad de democratizar o no eh, una cantidad de procesos culturales y políticos? Así que como ves, tenés un arco muy amplio, Arjun puede responder cualquiera de ellas y yo seguiré concentrado en tratar de elegir algunas otras. Great. So, uh, thank you, Alejandro. Those are all uh, large and important questions. I'll just be as concise as I can so that we can get more questions uh, into on the table. Uh, on populism, yes, it's clear that there's a complex difference uh, And the short way I put it is that left populism in many parts of the world has shrunk. Uh, may not have here, and that is very interesting then, that it is there kind of alongside right populism. But in a place like India, if I say left populism, Communist Party, this, that, they have no populist appeal. They have a certain ideological appeal. There are people who are lined up with the left, but you can't say there's any fervor, except at the grassroots, Maoist movements in the forests among tribal peoples, that, but that's not populist. That's actually popular, you know? That is really of the people, from the bottom. It's not populist in the sense, something from the top which is mobilizing the bottom. This is hard to see in other places, left populism. But if in Latin America we can see, uh, which I uh, believe, uh, even today in Argentina, that there is left populism and the right populism, maybe some other intermediary ones, That is fascinating to me, and I, I would love to learn more and know more, but it doesn't seem visible to me in, uh, so even Bernie Sanders, who was as close as you could get to a major US politician, you could call a left politician, there was populist appeal, it was students, it was certain academics, but you could not say it was a mass movement, and goes again to the feeling of, the question of feeling and affect. Is there anybody on the left who mobilizes Passion, um, you know, I can't see it. But in Latin America, it could be a very interesting difference. On Peron, no, I'm afraid uh, that showed my, uh, not a view or a, a hidden uh, opinion, but uh, simply uh, something which required more names. In other words, you say you can have a lot of different kinds of people who, fee so it's rather than being a nasty statement about Peron, you might say it was a redeeming statement about Hitler and Stalin, which is even worse. But the point is, they did have uh, messages to the population which we cannot dismiss. Uh, that, that, that's there. Uh, and in the case of Peron, no, I don't believe it, he was a Nazi at all. Uh, it's clear that he appealed to a whole kind of formation of uh, industrial and urban people, but which also made some connection to the agrarian uh, world in uh, Argentina. It's clearly a very, very complex matter, but what to me is interesting is in some ways, that kind of unifying capacity to me is always troubling, unless it's from a clear left platform, a clear liberal left platform, which is not totalitarian, not it's always a bit worrisome. Why? Because the measure is, what is the position on minorities? What is the position on cultural minorities or on economic minorities? Is it friendly and tolerant? Or is it eventually saying, we can't tolerate you. You will go to jail. That's the question. And it, with any case, whether it's Peron or somebody else, so Stalin, the answer is clear. Hundreds of thousands go to prison are killed. Hitler, it's even clearer. But with others of this type, Modi is a good example. People are not going to prison in the hundreds of thousands, but there's a lot of people being uh, uh, imprisoned. And I don't know how many know this. In India, I would say there have been 10 to 15 prominent journalists against this party who have been killed in cold blood. The latest is a woman in Bangalore, highly respected. This is Indian. This is not 
you know, some dark authority in place. It's Modi's India. We were just being killed like this. And the only thing they did was to say they think uh, the BJP's policies are problematic. They, they're not, uh, you know, ranting or raving. So, with Perón, no, I, I think I, I put that too loosely and in the wrong context and without much uh, explanation. Uh, then you had a couple of other things. There was a populist thing, and then... Uh, um, the reasons about uh, why, why people are following this alternative. Well, it's against their interests. So I think this is a very important question. In the US, always it's been fascinating to me why people are so ardently anti-communist. Now the answer is partly the Cold War and the propaganda against communism and so on, but it's an old story. It's 20s, 30s, it's during the Depression. There was something that allowed Americans to always be mobilized against any left uh, effort. Even in the midst of poverty, exploitation, and so on and so forth, they never would accept a left message. The most clear country to be resisting that on a large basis. To me, when I think about it, I think history can give us some answers to that resistance, but I think what is happening is that the experience of many of the people who accept these leaders, even when these leaders look like they're doing them no good, is because there's a kind of dignity deficit. What Trump convinces his followers is you have been humiliated. I will, so it's a kind of dark version of Charles Taylor. He's offering them a politics of recognition, which for them uh, is much more important then did you close my factory? Did you create new jobs? Yeah, that's there, but they will overlook this, that, and the other. They will overlook his sexism. They will overlook his racism. They will overlook this and that. Why? Because he's claiming to address and actually performatively addresses the dignity deficit. So I would say this is the reason generally when people go for these leaders, there is some wound uh, which is not a simple wound of inequality. It is some other kind of sense of damage, a kind of hidden injury, if you like, uh, which they seem to address. And then you had one last thing. That's the role of technology. Ah, yeah. That's, of course, a big one, and there's many, many ways to look at it. Uh, in general, uh, I take the view that th there's two sides to the new technologies. One is big data surveillance, that side, very frightening. Uh, it's the part that Snowden got involved in, we know this. In the US, again, which is, as usual, the great innovator, the great Schumpeterian, Schumpeterian source of creative destruction and innovation, the big tech companies, Facebook, Google, brother, are clearly in bed with the American government, with the National Security Agency. It's a terrifying thing, terrifying. On the other hand, social media is clearly important to the expression of voice at a local level. And there, my only worry is that the people who spread or do bad things through the new media are moving faster than the people who are doing good things. So whether it's ISIS or this one or that one, they somehow seem more able to reach their mark through social media. And I think there we need to think, how can we also get faster with progressive, inclusive messages, which otherwise seem to be sluggish, you know? But I'm optimistic on that side. My fear is on the big data surveillance authoritarian side. Muchas gracias. Bueno, hay varias preguntas eh, que hacen preguntas que yo no me hubiera animado a hacer, pero ellos las hacen, que es, ¿cuáles son las alternativas? Eh, digamos, decirnos cuál es la salida, eh, qué, qué hacer, ¿No? ¿Son los movimientos sociales la respuesta? Eh, ¿Cuáles son ejemplos de alternativas micro, macro, etcétera? En fin. Después, hay otra pregunta que tiene que ver con cuál es el papel de lo territorial, del territorio, del espacio en estos procesos de globalización. ¿No? Creo, creo que está un poco vinculada con esa gran discusión sobre el fin del territorio, etcétera, etcétera. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe I use this to make some general observations uh, which come out of these questions. Of course, uh, I should be quick to say that I have no uh, party and uh, no message, uh, no platform, no election I'm running in, uh, whether <laughs> local, national, or international. But uh, I have uh, hopes. And I'll mention something very narrow about which I have written, which I think is actually a step towards something very important. It's in the area not uh, that we've talked about, but the area of uh, poverty, development, inclusion, justice, that track. And there I have written, and I continue to believe that we need to make uh, research a human right. That is the capacity to conduct research, the capacity to create new knowledge. And I believe that a large part of the failure of kind of modernization, development experiment over the last 60 years is not for all the reasons that we are told, but because the people at the receiving end never have the capacity to look ahead and to define a problem and to go and do research about something new. They are always uh, at the last point. That is, they are always relying on the research from elsewhere. So this may seem like a very small or modest thing, but I honestly believe that when the capacity to generate new knowledge is multiplied at a mass level globally, there will be a very huge change in the terms of relations between poorer societies and richer societies, poorer classes and richer classes, because now there's a huge knowledge gap. And the knowledge gap is not just knowledge, it's not information, it's the capacity to generate new knowledge, which is my definition of research. And so I've written about this in my book, Future as Cultural Fact. I've also had a small organization in Mumbai that I started about almost uh, 17 years ago, whose aim was to teach research techniques to people outside the Anglophone world. Simple things like surveys, interviews, uh, stories about family, neighborhood, very small things, but they have incredible empowering uh, effect. So I, I won't talk about solutions to big problems, but I will certainly say there are things like this. And in the area of finance, I do believe all sorts of uh, socially uh, uh, valuable entities can enter the global risk, uncertainty, debt, financial markets. This is a very controversial statement, but I believe it, without becoming uh, exploited by financial experts. So maybe uh, I'll conclude with just one observation on the question of the nation came up today at lunch. I do believe that the big elephant in the room of many of our discussions is the nation state. That is, I have heard leaders all over the world say, you know, we should change multinational governance, we should change the UN, we should change the EU, we should change this, we should change that. But should we change the form of the nation state? That is, that package of sovereignty, law, rights, with a line around it, that piece of the architecture is never touched in official discussions. Everything else is discussed. It's open. But this thing has a full lock. And I don't think it's because people are being insincere. It's because it's hardwired into our thinking. It's the toughest one to, and for 30 years now, I've been thinking, OK, what's an alternative design? And after <laughs> I make one inch of progress every 10 years, but now my feeling is, at the moment, it's can we take the economy, law and rights, and loyalty and belonging, and put them in different architectures? Not say all of them have to be in one envelope. So for economic purposes, I'm with this. For loyalty, I'm with that. Nation state, voila, it's gone. Now, of course, it's not easy to do because there are huge vested interests. But from a thinking point of view, I think there are other designs. Then, of course, one has to realize them politically. Bueno, nos quedan cinco minutos, así que yo te voy a decir dos o tres preguntas y vos respondés una sola, la que vos quieras. Eh, por un lado, eh, alguien pregunta qué opinas sobre los resultados recientes de las elecciones en Estados Unidos donde no funcionó el trampismo sin Trump. ¿No? Eh, 
Otra, hay personas que preguntan sobre la cuestión más de las finanzas y de las formas de reserva de valor y de las cuestiones de la tarjeta de crédito y respecto del papel del crédito, la deuda y el consumo en el formato del capitalismo global. Eh, hay otras preguntas que tienen que ver con la relación entre el papel que tienen hoy los organismos multilaterales, las Naciones Unidas, eh, el Fondo Monetario, etcétera, etcétera, y su relación con el Estado-Nación. Y hay una pregunta que dice, ¿cuál es el lugar que cumplen los que tienen los sectores financieros del mercado de la salud en las crisis financieras globales y en las políticas neoliberales? Todo eso lo respondes en cinco minutos y después nos vamos. No, lo que podemos hacer es que vas, vas a responder la que vos quieras y después nos quedaremos charlando en el pasillo con... Great. Well, uh, thank you all for your patience. I'll say only one thing which I mentioned uh, earlier today and which is uh, very much addressed in, uh, or partly addressed in the little book on finance which Alejandro mentioned, but I'm working on it still. And that is an effort to rethink Marx, who in his most crucial parts of his model in uh, Capital, in the three volumes of Capital, uh, had a very important theory about the core of capitalism from the economic point of view, which was uh, surplus value, extraction of surplus labor value, and it was relative and uh, uh, abstract, and he made all sorts of distinctions, but the labor they had to do with the production of commodities. Whatever the theory was, that was the labor. In my view, we have come to a time, because finance Uh, capitalism has massively exceeded industrial manufacturing capitalism. For example, the value of uh, the global market in derivatives is five times global GDP. That tells you right away what is the proportion of finance to everything else. Since that's so, I think we need to revise our thinking and to think of all of ourselves as now laborers still, but what we produce is not commodities or parts of commodities, it's debt. We are debt producers, that is our role. And the question is, can we rise as debt producers? Can we organize as debt producers to resist and uh, indeed topple the structure of extraction of surplus value, but in the debt world rather than the product world? So I'll stop with that uh, somewhat schematic. <laughs> Uh, observation and thank you all for your tremendous patience. Excellent questions. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Arjun. Muchas gracias a la Fundación. Muchas gracias al Malva y muchas gracias a todos ustedes por compartir estos minutos con nosotros. <laughs>